Welcome back to Hello County. If you're just tuning into this particular segment, we'll upload them separately on YouTube, Hello County, which by the way, if you are seeing it that way, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Sharing is caring. And, uh, but we were talking American Madness, uh, published in 2020. Mm -hmm. But now we're gonna go back to 2015. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think we're gonna end up going back even further in time. Okay. We have some very supernatural, spooky things to talk about. We were discussing just off camera, Paranormal Conference. Now, mm -hmm. is this your creation? Are you the founder or you're just very active in it? Because that was just held when? Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, October 13th through the 15th. And I'm assuming it's an annual yeah. conference. Yeah. And uh, tell us a little bit about that, even though we missed it for 2023, but we can pencil in our calendars for 2024. Yeah, so I am the founder, and I'm uh, currently one of the co-organizers, and um, the first year was 2015 because it was designed originally to be a promotional event for my book, Monster Hunters. I was like, rather than just do a bookstore appearance, why don't I invite some of these people that I met while I worked on the book to talk about themselves on stage, right? And then it was just, it was such a good time that it became an annual event. Um, How and could it now, not be a good time? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's uh, people really love Especially it. Especially in Milwaukee. <laughs> yeah, there's not really, a lot of cities have a conference like this, but Milwaukee didn't. And so I think people really appreciate that there's a forum where people can talk about these subject matters, you know. Because well, it happens to everyone. Encounters, yeah. whether you talk about it publicly admit it or not I'm saying everyone has a story and many have more than one yeah. yeah 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 so that said tell us about the book yeah so my first book was titled heroes in the night it was about real-life superheroes the subculture I finished the book and my my publisher for that book Chicago Review Press uh, we're like, we really like the job that you did with this. Um, what do you think you're gonna work on next? And uh, so I pitched a couple of ideas and the one that they really liked was, I was like, you know, I've always been a little bit curious about these people I sometimes see on TV that are looking for ghosts and stuff and um, I'm interested in that stuff. I've, um, like I said at the beginning of this uh, show, of something I was interested in when I was a kid. Uh, I love shows like Unsolved Mysteries, you know, oh, one of my in, search, in Search Of <laughs> with uh, Leonard Nimoy. Um, so they're like, okay, yeah, go for that. Because paranormal themed stuff is um, a pretty good bet, right? You've seen there's so many reality shows based oh, on so that many. And stuff. So I got to work and what I really love at the beginning of a big project if it's a book or even a long article, you've got to kind of assemble, you've got to think about the pieces that you need to make that story happen. So I didn't know who these people were going to be, but I was like, I need to find like the grandmaster <laughs> guru of cryptozoology, which is the study of unknown creatures like Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster. I was just going to say Nessie. Yeah. One and of my personal favorites. Chupacabras, whatever. Uh, so I found that person. That person's Lauren Coleman. Um, he's a very prolific author and he has an international cryptozoology museum in Portland, Maine. So, uh, you know, I got to take a trip out to the East Coast. I visited Lauren, checked out his wonderful museum interviewed him and um, you know I thought that was an important thing and then another thing I was like I've got to find a somewhat local uh, um, ghost investigation team that mm -hmm. I can follow over and over again so I just googled and I found the paranormal investigators of Milwaukee who are still around and uh, so right in your backyard yes you yes. traveled to Maine yeah yeah, and uh, it was really great because I, I dropped them an email and I said, hey, I'm writing this book. I want to kind of follow you over and over again, and you're gonna, I'm going to write a few chapters about you and your team. 
and they said, sure, you know, uh, why don't you come to our next meeting? It's at one of our houses. I was like, oh, great, I'm in already. That was easy. So I show up. There's like nine people. They're all wa wearing matching polo shirts with their team logo on it. And they, they grill me. They're asking me all these questions about what my intentions and writing this book are and stuff. So I was like, oh, this is like a job interview, actually, not me being a fly on the wall. And uh, I was done, and they're like, all right, we're going to deliberate, and we'll tell you if you can follow us. So I was like, I don't know Wait, how that went. That? This is, okay, so this would probably be 2013, okay. I think, yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, and then I got the email, and they said, yep, you can, you can join us. We're doing an investigation at the Riverside Theater next week. And I got to go, and, uh, and we mentioned this before we were recording. They brought all of these cases full of equipment, like um, night vision cameras and uh, electromagnetic field detectors. So right out of Ghostbusters, the movie. Yeah, kind of. Just and not the Echo One. Right. And some of the devices, like, I'm still not quite sure how they're supposed to operate, but um, they're a very interesting group. I like the group because they do try to debunk um, what their, what their the supposed experiences are. So a lot of times they've been able to tell people, and I think sometimes people are disappointed by this, that, hey, that thing you thought was a ghost, it was actually you step on the floorboard here and it creaks over there, so that's what you're hearing. It's not a ghost, you know. But I think that's great because that means that when they do find something that they can't explain, it's a little bit more compelling because you know that they've made the effort to try to explain it other ways first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a, so. a question. Yeah. Not just with the, the Milwaukee group, but how do you gain the trust of uh, these individuals that you write about? Well, that's a good question. Um, it, and I, I've not always been successful. There's been times where okay. they're like, we're not talking to you. And that's fine. It's fine because there's usually... It always. Open. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just... You just want to approach people and be honest with who you are and what your intentions are. Mm -hmm. And uh, and be respectful. I mean, I think that's what's got me through so much is a lot of... I, a lot of the people that I talk about are unusual and they know that what they do is kind of unusual. So they're aware that there's people that want to laugh at them and ridicule them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't do that. I, I think I have a good track record now that people can refer to where they see that that's not my intention. I'm genuinely curious mm -hmm. as to what you're doing. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that comes through. So I guess well, that's the answer to that. And, and that actually leads me to one of my questions. and. Um, we had just touched base on pre-internet, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> and and a group um, APRO. Yes, the what? Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. I was just going to ask. I don't even know what, but it, it's definitely now they were one of well an earlier group because again I'm sure sightings and the phenomena in and of itself yeah dates way way back. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that group? And yeah, very cool thing um, that not a lot of people know of, but they they started in Wisconsin, specifically in Door County. Sheboygan, where my grandparents had a house, or outside of, or near. Uh, it was in Door County. Oh, I forgot the name of the town. Because uh, I, I actually believe that on Jimmy Church's podcast that you mentioned Sheboygan. Oh, well, that's the only reason I brought it up no I, I must have been mistaken if I mentioned that but it was it was in Door County well, or maybe we could clear that up here at Hello County yeah but Wisconsin but, yes can't take can't take that away Wisconsin yes uh, north. Coral Lorenzen and uh, her husband Jim started the organization in Sturgeon Bay that's what I meant you know what you said Sturgeon Bay yeah. on the podcast I'm the one who supplemented Sheboygan yeah Ben and I are two for two now on, you know, thinking that we're saying the right city, and, <laughs> and we're not. <laughs> but but uh, Sturgeon Bay. Yes, and they had a sighting, um, this was in the 50s, they had a sighting with a lot of other people in Door County of this giant UFO that passed over the bay, mm -hmm. and, and they all witnessed it, and, um, you know, it was a life-changing experience for them 
and there really weren't other organizations at that time dedicated to this. And there was no internet. Yeah, no, not at all. And so, you know, they, they created, and I was really glad I got to see a collection of these reprinted, but they did it the old-fashioned way on a typewriter. They uh, made this newsletter. It was like, you know, maybe eight to 12 page long newsletter uh, typed hand up on type. a hand typed on a typewriter. And then they made, um, it wasn't even a photocopier. It was a predecessor. I forget what it was called, but it was kind of like an early version Mim Mimeo? of the Mimeograph or Thank something you. like that. Oh, that had that yeah. smell. Yeah. And um, they developed this network of people who subscribed and they would, they would mail it out. Mm -hmm. And um, they also wrote several books collecting some of these cases together. Um, and then eventually, uh, after the Lorenzans passed away, people who were involved with their organization reformed to um, uh, the Mutual UFO Network, which still exists today and is the largest UFO research organization in the world. They were the OG. Yeah. So they really started all that and have a very important part in uh, UFO research history, for sure. Are you familiar with, I think it's, I think the group is called SETI? Yeah, right, yeah. I, Search I, for I, I participated with SETI for yeah. several yeah. months when I first relocated out to uh, Connecticut from here. I spent, I'm born and bred Wisconsin, but I, I spent some time on the eastern seaboard. So for those that aren't familiar, I believe SETI's still up and running. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because why wouldn't it be? Yeah, yeah, they have um, a large facility in California. And and for those that aren't familiar with it, um, and I think it's brilliant. Uh, so obviously it started, I don't know, government, military, combined, whatever, but eventually they, they packaged it so that you've got your computer, you know, it's like, you know, computer space and computer processing and things like that. They have a large array of radar dishes that are searching specifically. Searching yeah, for, for mm -hmm. there's, there's something out there. Are you familiar with SETI? Yeah. I think, I feel like there was a brief period where, because they had the distributed kind of processing thing, so you could you could search, uh, help search with your own computer. I thought that was pretty that's, cool that's what, yeah, that's as, a, as a younger kid, yeah. To um, do. Because back then it was like actually a computer sitting at a desktop had the processor and it wasn't like today where we're all just walking around. Kevin, are you familiar with SETI? Being of the younger ilk? <laughs> they're really, um, yeah, they're, they do a lot of serious research into listening. SETI? Yeah. SETI. Uh, S-E-T-I? Yeah, it's, it stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. I am not. You're not searching? You're not searching. Not searching. You need to get on the... Talk to T. He'll, he'll I, hook you up. We'll, we'll I, hook you up. I want to know that I'm worthy of the ghosts coming to me. <laughs> and well, so I want okay, them to so seek the me out for my ego. Ghosts. You're mixing and matching here. <laughs> I got the wrong idea of study. <laughs> If they're so cool, the aliens can find Kevin. He doesn't yeah, need to go searching for They need to log into Keddy. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin. To Keddy. <laughs> to to Keddy. Yeah. Well, I like that a lot. So since since we're, you know, talking UFO, and it's a it's a tried and true Wisconsin tradition. Yeah. I mean, we are the land of lakes. I think they like water. <laughs> <laughs> it could. It's a theory. Yeah. I don't know, it's, it's one of my theories. Um, I have the family UFO story, and I believe you have your own. You I had, do. You yeah. had your own. Yeah. And uh, who, who do you want to go first? You, you go ahead. I'd be curious to hear. I mean, he knows his, but he's going to share it. So mine was, um, I was a teenager hanging out at home, which is rural Wisconsin, yes. outside of Broadhead, Wisconsin, and hanging out with Joyce and Frank, my fabulous parents, and it was like a hot summer night, lights were off, it was more or less bedtime, but you know, I, I probably wandered out for a snack, and m noticed that mom was, was sitting in the living room and, and really looking hard out, out of the window, 
into the darkness. You know, at that point, you know, there wasn't light pollution or anything like that, and it was just glorious. And so it's kind of like, you know, I wandered in. What are you doing? She goes, there's some interesting, interesting lights out there. And I, yeah, I sit down, and, and in short order, Frank came along. You know, what are you two doing? So he joins, and what it was... And we enjoyed watching them play for like a solid 20 some minutes. And it was three points of light and they would, they would zing back and forth and they'd zing back and forth and they'd hopscotch each other and they would turn different colors, typically in the green, amber, um, red, Mm -hmm. You know, but they would they would switch off and you know flash different colors, and they they together they sing and, and and they were just so playful and having so much fun, and we were so enamored. We just sat there. I come by my gift of gab honestly, and we were all dumbstruck and just silently enjoying. And then eventually, almost as though on some unknown cue, they they came together kind of, because it was just three points of light. No bigger than, you know, I mean, like a good-sized star in, in that panorama of night sky. But it was, it was the way that they weren't acting naturally like any star or anything that we knew of. And they joined together, and they did kind of a little, joined a triangle, so one was in front and two kind of flanking. And they just very slowly started drifting away. That they unified in color and just slowly started drifting away. And we knew that they were going. And my dad said, I'm going to get in the truck and follow them. <laughs> and and I, I panicked because if he knew Frank, I thought, they're going to take him. <laughs> they, he's going to be one that, that he's not coming back. <laughs> and so I, I, I said to mom, I said, I'm going with him because if, if he's out, they'll take him. And, and, uh, and I don't know what lore we were, you know, I was referring to, it was the 70s. And, uh, and then as we were in the truck and we were like out driving in the general direction that they were heading, we had them in our sights at some point, but then we'd lose sight. And at that point I started to get really scared T because it's like I just knew we were gonna come up over a, a crest or something and there they'd be out in the cornfield. Yeah. And, yeah. and then it's like, why am I with my dad? Why didn't I stay home with my mother where it was <laughs> safe? Needless to say, we didn't find them, or did we? Didn't find them. Or did we? They moved we? quickly. They moved quickly. So that's my story. Mm -hmm. What Very happened to you? Where was that again? Connected? Uh, you uh, no, this was actually in Broadhead. Oh, by Broadhead. But yeah, okay. Yeah. So you can understand when I learned yeah. of SETI and things like that when I was much older and living in Connecticut, that it's like, oh, well, heck yeah, I want to be part of that. Sign me up. Mm-hmm. Uh... So my story, um, like I said, I had, I had these different boxes that I wanted to tick working on this book. So I met Lauren Coleman. Um, I met the local ghost investigation team. I went to Mothman Festival in West Virginia. Mothman's this That's eerie a big, creature. That, that was, what was that, from the 60s? 60s? Yeah, 66. And preempted a bridge collapse? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I remember one of my favorite shows was... Yeah, Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. A lot of weird stuff happened there in the 60s, apparently. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm cruising along. I'm getting all these different things. And I'm like, well, one thing I really want to do is I want to go out bigfooting. Because it seems like fun, right? It seems interesting. Um, Not to be confused with Yeti, but they're similar. They're cousins, I'd say, yeah. So uh, I, I developed this good relationship with Lauren Coleman at the Cryptozoology Museum. I was like, hey, you know, do you know anyone like in the Midwest who's doing any Bigfooting? Because um, that's like one of the last things I want to try to, to do. And he was like, oh, yeah, I know this guy in Michigan uh, named Jim Sherman. And, and he's an interesting guy. And so I contacted Jim. <coughs> and, and this is what I love about this, this story. Jim's a seemingly really normal guy. 
He uh, is a high school history teacher. He coaches the track team. He's got a wife and a kid and uh, just seems like the most normal guy you would meet. But he has this unusual hobby where on his weekends he likes to go out in the woods and look for Bigfoot. And hey, he's not hurting anyone. <laughs> right? And uh, so he said, yeah, there's this property actually I'm returning to and a lot of weird stuff. In Michigan. Yeah, in the middle of Michigan. It's, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's in Isabella County, so we refer to this property as Isabella because there's not even a town nearby. So, um, so you're really out there. Yeah, and he was like, why don't, you know, let's, let's do like a weekend camping trip. And, um, you get yourself into there. some very unique situations with your... With your um, well, I like to, yeah. I think that's, that's my strength um, as a writer is I'm not like, you know... I'm not like a, a very scholarly, uh, I can't even say the word, I'm so unscholarly. Um, but, you know, I think my writing benefits a lot from my experience mm -hmm. that I can share with other people. Right, right. So I'm good at like being game for doing something strange um, and taking along with people. So what time of year was the trip? Th this was in July. It was in oh. July. And uh, this couple that owned a farm had all these strange experiences. They said something would throw rocks at their house and they're in the middle of nowhere. Stuff would get moved around in their yard. They would hear weird growling sounds. They found what looked like footprints. Um, and I think this is the creepiest story they told. They said that they knew when these creatures were coming because they'd hear dogs barking way down the street and then it gets So closer. more than one. Yeah, yeah. So And then they would hear dogs barking closer and then finally their dogs would start to go nuts and their horses would get upset and that's when they knew that the creature was around because all their animals were going wild so i was like all right well this is interesting we um we walked around we went hiking we talked to some people that had witnessed bigfoot in the area not just on this farm property so this is all interesting stuff but um we're not really encountering bigfoot the last night that we're there, um, I'm about to go to sleep in my tent, and I hear this blood-curdling howl, which seems to be right next to my tent. And I was extremely frightened. I'd have been paralyzed I was, I was. I couldn't move. I didn't know what to do. I was like, I've got no idea what to do. So eventually, I'm brave enough to unzip the tent. I thought for sure I'd see, like something big and hairy out there but there wasn't uh jim's in his jeep trying to text me i ran over and like opened the door and scared him again badly we're sitting in the the jeep we're like what what was that did you hear it yeah of course i did and um we don't know what it was uh he had like a recording to this day. no i it could have been a, a coyote or something but that's not the weird thing that happened that night so I'm scared and I'm seeing this Jeep and I'm looking out along, there's like a field and then a tree line. Mm -hmm. And I was like... And no light pollution. No, no <laughs> light pollution. And I'm like, wow, I'm so scared. I'm, I must be scared because I'm shaking because the star is moving. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. That's like moving, moving. So I was like, Jim, do you see us? We got out. There's this ball of light up in the sky. And kind of like you're saying, it would zip really quickly over here, kind of hover up and down, and then zip over here. Yeah, stars here. don't do that. No, they're it, pretty stationary. Yeah, and we looked well, at through. Falling star, but we looked at it through binoculars. We did see some sort of like green uh, and amber light on this thing. Once in a while, a light would come out of the bottom and illuminate the tree line, and then like blink off, and it just kept moving. We got it on video and I can see how people get very frustrated because the camera had a lot of trouble focusing on this thing and keeping track of it. So you can see it, but it's not, it doesn't look like it did when we saw it. And um, I have no explanation for what it was. We like ran through everything. It wasn't an airplane. It wasn't a drone. Um, it wasn't well, like what, what whatever. Year was this approximately? Uh, this was, let's see, it would probably be 2013 or 14. Okay. I don't remember. I mean, like, like what? Now everyone and their uncle has a, a drone. Yeah. Whether it's well, toy it didn't or, or pro level or whatever. I mean, so. It wasn't the. It wasn't a drone. It wasn't yeah. common yeah. at the time either, and it wasn't a drone. 
yeah. And so I don't know what it was. I never have said, oh, yeah, this was definitely the alien mothership, but I've never seen anything move like that, and I don't know what, what it was. Did it change you in any way? Um, I think it... Having your own eyewitness. It gave me a little bit of a humbling perspective because I would tell people, and they're like, okay, and you were... You're out there in the sun with a Bigfooter all day, and then you saw this thing, huh? And I'm like, you know, whatever. <laughs> I got to, I got to experience what many people experience themselves, which is people are just kind of make a joke about it, and you're like, I actually saw this thing, okay? So, so I think that was helpful to me, actually. So back to. Monster Hunters. Mm -hmm. At what point were you accepted into Milwaukee's group? And are, are, I want to say PIM? Yeah, Paranormal Investigators in Milwaukee. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. PIM. PIM. PIM is what they're known in, in, as And short. Uh, at what point were 2013-ish? Yeah, they were one of the first. Uh, Lauren Coleman and them were the first two people that I established contact with. So... That was 2013. And one name that I jotted down, is it Noah Lee? Lee, no, Lee. yeah, Noah Lee. Still yeah. very active. I yeah. Because I just watched a YouTube video on, you know, debunking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, from him. Uh, yeah. Equipment. And yeah. it's kind of like, really, this is just. And he's not, you know. Would, he, would be good for Noah's a, a very <laughs> Noah's a very smart guy. He's a microbiologist, so he has you know props, three yeah. three degrees, and you know uh, believes in a scientific method. So mm -hmm. I like love I, that. Yeah, actually, yeah, very interesting team, and yeah, I was drawn to them. And they're uh, still very active. I'm because assuming. It, yeah, because there there are some ghost teams where they're like, oh, we'll do something maybe once a year. But PIM was very active, and that was very appealing because then I'm like, oh, I can jump on a few different investigations mm -hmm. to write about. So talk, talk about the people that call in PIM to, to come investigate something. Are, are, are people, like, phoning them and saying, can you check out this yeah. thing? Well, Who are these people? Like, like yeah. the theater that you, you mentioned, because you yeah. actually were on site. I'm assuming someone at the theater had to be on board because you can't just wander in. Yeah, I mean, there's usually there's two tracks here. There's um, the historic buildings and businesses, and that's usually instigated by the team because they want to investigate there. Uh, so, you know, I got to investigate Riverside Theater with them, Central Library, uh, Brumder Mansion is a bed and breakfast. And so in those cases, usually the businesses are humoring them and also thinking they can maybe get like a good social media post out of it. Like, oh, hey, the ghost team swung by here and look what they found, you know. Well, what then, is it, the Fister Hotel? Is, am, I, am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, Fister Hotel doesn't, doesn't want to go there. Huh. They don't. Uh, I think that they are. They're very high-end establishment, are right? They, not? they don't want like people walking and around. Notoriously like, <laughs> known for <laughs> being haunted. They're yeah, uh, yeah. ghost yeah. Geiger counters yeah. or whatever they're using. But uh, the other track is, like you say, there are people who contact them because they're having experience in their homes, and they want the team to come in and uh, try to verify that. Uh, PIM is not a group that can, some groups will say they can exercise the ghosts. PIM doesn't claim that they have that ability, but they can at least be like, well, here's what we found, you know. Uh, and like it's I say. It's not just your furnace kicking on. <laughs> sometimes people are actually disappointed. Yeah. Because yeah. I think they're looking for this, you know, uh, incredible experience. And then they find out that it's a leaky radiator or something. It's kind of disappointing. What's so. the what's the most persuasive or or um, convincing uh, you know one of these investigations that you're aware of that they did you know you, you talked about them trying to debunk them yeah. uh, but sometimes I assume they can't um, and yeah I would say and I think that they would agree um, it's actually not a location in Wisconsin but there's kind of a notorious haunted honky-tonk bar in Kentucky called Bobby Mackey's Music World. 
And, uh, and what's going on there? All sorts of stuff. It's uh, apparently built on the grounds of a former um, slaughterhouse. Okay. So there's a remnants of an old well in the basement, and they say this is a portal to hell. Uh, a guy actually tried to sue Bobby Mackey's because he claimed he was beat up by a ghost in the men's room. Wow. And that led them to have a sign, At like a disclaimer, <laughs> on the front door. Right, yeah, saying that we're not responsible for your bodily harm if you're attacked by a ghost. More, one of the more unusual uh, signs I've seen in a bar. But um, there's all sorts of stories, all sorts of, of, of ghosts going on there, and uh, that place has frightened him. They've had some frightening experiences there. Um, one of their members claimed that something pushed her against the wall and lifted her a couple inches off the ground, unseen force. Uh, another member Just like the movie, the entity. said that they felt a sort of possession where they had this, all of a sudden they had this very hot, irrational anger towards her teammates where she said she felt like killing them. Um, was that you know, in Milwaukee or were they investigating somewhere else? No, this is at Bobby this is Mackey's at Bobby Music Mackey's, World. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I got really to join very them. Very angry, there. very angry yeah. entities yes. connected yeah. with violence, angry violent entities. Right. Yeah. Do you think there's something like there's like some sort of analog with people that are susceptible to hypnosis? Mm -hmm. You know, there there are people that are are more inclined to be uh, hypnotized, or they're more likely to be hypnotized yeah. than others. Are these are these ghost hunters or people that experience these things? Do you think there's some kind of similar where they're just open to or susceptible or, or impressionable or yeah that's such a great point to bring up because i i really do feel that way i have never had an experience seeing a ghost myself yeah. but i've talked to people and i can tell you that they're very convinced that they have and so i believe that they've had some kind of experience i don't know what it is mm -hmm. and i definitely can't explain it but to them it's very real so i think like you're saying some people have a different field of perception than other people yeah. might is the only way I can explain it. Have you experienced anything, Ben, that you just couldn't explain? Not that I can think of off the top of my off the top of my head. Okay. Um, I don't have any vivid paranormal uh, experiences outside of your children. Outside of my children, who are cr who are crazy, uh, which is a different thing, but <laughs> they are ghoulish, I guess. But they are fully manifested, yeah. Kevin. <laughs> Why do ghosts wear sheets? No. <laughs> um, kind of off the topic of ghosts, but still monsters and goblins. Have you heard of the Beast of Bray Road? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that a that is from book. Elkhorn, which is where I'm from. So yeah. not that yeah. it needs a lot of explanation, but uh, no, beast yeah. I just like wanted to... Beast, like bigfoot type? Yeah, beast, yeah. Because I also heard Kettle Moraine has yeah, had uh, big foot sightings. Yeah, Bigfoot and other entities in Kel Moraine. The Beast of Bray Road is a Wisconsin classic. It was um, 19, early 90s, I think. Um, I, I love the story so much. And I got to go to Elkhorn and interview Linda Godfrey is uh, the name of the author. And at that time, she was working for a small newspaper that like served the whole county out there. And her editor was like, um, we got a couple of stories about people reporting seeing a werewolf running around near Bray Road, which is this country lane in Elkhorn, pretty typical country lane. And it's that dark road that you were explaining earlier. Yeah. That's Bray Road. Definitely not Bigfoot. Big, <laughs> Bigfoot would not be confused with a so, werewolf. And one of these witnesses said that they were driving down Bray Road and they saw this beast at the side of the road, like, eating some roadkill. As you do. So Linda's like, all right, I'll look into this. She interviews a couple people. She's like, what a weird story. And then, I think this is the key point, she decides to go to a local, like, animal control shelter. And she was like, hey, this is going to sound real weird to you, but people are saying they're seeing this thing. Do you know, have any idea what that might be? And this guy's like, hang on for a second. This is like the X-Files or something. He goes into his office. He comes back. He has a manila folder. It's marked werewolf file. And it's full of reports from different people who say that they've seen this thing. There, there's a 
So I graduated in 09, so a little bit after that. But there's a lot of uh, conspiracies as to who that was. And yeah, uh, there, right. there's a few names that get thrown out there as far as someone who may have went around in oh, the werewolf. Oh, run around in the Yeah, yeah. and it, it's all, like, yeah. still kind of unknown. But And this is uh, called the Beast of Bray? Bray, Road? B-R-A-Y, yeah. Okay. B-R-A-Y, yeah. And, uh, and, and Linda was, you know, this was, like, she broke the story, and then she went on to write a book about the Beast of Bray Road, and then that well, turned into a career. You're right. They made a she very wrote, bad movie about it. Yes. Really? It's, it's not that great of a movie. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, she went on to write a lot of books about Wisconsin hauntings and other monster sightings all across the country. She had a she had a really good career in sort of this niche field of reporting on monsters. And uh, I got to meet her and interview her, and um, she just passed away last year. So, Aww. but very cool person. Yeah. Well, she'll be visiting with you later today. <laughs> so, uh, Don wants to know: Have you been to Paulding Light? I haven't uh, been there. All, I, know I don't it know is. what or where it is. Uh, it's it's way up north. I want to say it's by the UP border, if I'm not mistaken. And it's just kind of this um, famous light that it appears. Um, I heard that the explanation is just a funny angle where you're seeing car headlights, but the direction that you're seeing them in makes it look very strange. Hmm. So it's kind of a classic story. Well, she included a link. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> Wikipedia entry on the Paulding light. Uh, experiences yourself. Uh, the UFO sighting, like I said, I haven't seen a ghost myself, but when I did join Pim at Bobby Mackey's, um, and they're like, are you ready for this? I don't know if you're ready. You're kind of a, a newbie. Uh, so I didn't experience anything directly, but I was right next to one of their team members, and um, she began to cry, and she said that she'd gone blind. And um, now this no, is Noah a member of the team like, that's been yeah. part of the team for... Many years. Many yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Noah's like, are you sure you just can't see because it's dark? So he shined a flashlight in her face, and she was just, like, staring blankly ahead and crying and, and said she couldn't feel her hands. And what were you and thinking I was during like, this time? Uh, <laughs> I was like, I don't, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have gone on this investigation. <laughs> maybe it's true. Uh, so, you know, stuff like that. A sec not something that I experienced, but that someone else experienced. So, how many times did you go out with PIM? Um, I believe around a dozen times at least. Um, maybe a little and bit more. And that was one of the times. Yeah. It happened to be yeah. all yeah. the way in Kentucky. Okay. Yeah, they were, they were traveling because I love this. They would all take their vacation time at the same time, and then they would use it. They would travel around and do this whirlwind, like, famous haunted uh, lunatic asylum, famous haunted church, you know, and just hit up like four or five different states and then come back home all within two weeks. Wow. So, And I happened to be traveling, checking out other stuff, and so we kind of met, we met up in Kentucky, it was kind of the, the halfway point for both of us. Another question. I kind of was thinking more about the hypnosis thing, but I, I was also, I started to think about, you know, you have similar things in like certain religious experiences, right? People speaking in tongues or something like that. And I wondered if, <laughs> how, how much you kind of know about uh, the background of some of these paranormal investigators, like what was their upbringing? Because I imagine maybe if they'd been well, raised no, in, a, in a very religious household, this would kind of manifest itself in a different way. Um, Good yeah, question, Ben. Yeah, yeah, many different motivations for these investigators. Um, for Noah, I think it was a scientific curiosity, you mm -hmm. know. Um, you know, he said that he had, he was going to, to college and he had some downtime, you know, because he didn't have a lot of classes. So he watched a lot of ghost hunters and he kind of, he liked some things he did and other things he's like, that's not how you would, how that would work. So I think it was scientific curiosity. For others, like there was a police officer that was part of him, and he had a near-death experience where he almost okay. died on the job. And mm -hmm. I think, like thinking about mortality and what the afterlife might be, uh, was his motivation. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, I think some are just want to belong to a unique social club or something. So, but yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of different things that draw people to it from all walks of life too. So what how uh, do people get your book, Monster Hunters. Mm-hmm. Um, that's still available from Chicago Review Press. And uh, again, if you go to my website, tcrulos.com, I have a tab on my website for each of my books okay. where there's more information and a link so people can buy them. Two, two things. Yeah. When I went to the website, when I see the list of months and year, like you can go through your archives yeah. up to date, yeah. One of the things I'm always fascinated by on those is you can see where someone started and where it kind of tailed off. With you, there was no tail off. It goes all the way up to, to yeah. now. And you've been doing it 2014, I think, is when your website probably uh, starts it starts archiving it. Uh, no, 2012. March 2012 is the first date. That makes sense. So that is a long was, list. Um, uh, my first book. Heroes of Night came out 2013, mm-hmm. so I think I started the website. Built up to it. Because I wanted to, you know, have a, a place for people to find me. And Yeah. 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 So I, I think you may have the longest list of the <laughs> archive dates, which is cool. Plenty to check out. And then favorite Halloween movie, because we're talking about ghosts, and my oh. favorite, like, ghost encounter is always Beetlejuice. The Entity. I don't know. Have you ever heard of that movie, The Entity? I've heard of it. I don't think I, I've seen it's, it. It's a very 80s. Um. Favorite mm-hmm. Halloween movie? Uh, if you consider Beetlejuice Juice a Halloween movie, that's fine. <laughs> that's a good or, one. That, that's what that's I kept thinking one. about when we were talking ghosts. That's one of my favorites for sure. Um, I really am partial, and, and again, I think this is because my dad. Um, I love the old, like Universal monster movies: Dracula, The Wolfman, mm-hmm. Creature from the Black Lagoon. I just think that they're beautifully shot in that black and white and. Just makes me feel like that's what Halloween is, kind of. Mm-hmm. So all of those movies, I'm I'm very partial to. But yeah, I love like Beetlejuice. I don't like I don't like a lot of modern horror stuff, especially like slasher stuff. The slasher is not, genre. Not really my my speed. So, but yeah, to me, yeah. I mean, when when I was coming up. Um, I want to say it was Friday nights had the creature features, mm-hmm. and um, apropos to nothing, my my buddy Lori and I, uh, the Rossmans and Garthwaites used to get together, not every single Friday night, but a lot, and that left Lori and I to our own devices, <laughs> and they load us up with Coca Cola and Fritos and plunk us down in the in the rec room, the recreation room, where we were enjoying. The creature features and Mr. Mephisto was was the local oh, yeah, guy. Oh the Madison host, yeah. Mr. Yeah. Mephisto. Anyway, he he uh, would announce the movies and plug yeah. whatever he needed to and whatever. Yeah. I ended up doing a project uh, for Trackside, Trackside, which now that was Elkhart, where who has the uh, the track Elkhart, Wisconsin, right? Not Elkhorn. Oh, Elkhorn is where I'm from. Right, but you don't have a racetrack, a well-known racetrack. We do not. So it's Elkhart, Wisconsin. Yes. It has a, a well-known racetrack, and so I met someone when I was working uh, on my degree, at, and it trans- communication arts and science at Edgewood at the time translated to theater. And so I had an opportunity to do something for this uh, local show called Trackside. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to do um, very Saturday Night Live commercials. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there was a male actor and there was myself and my my character was Charlotte Winston. And we only would buy products that sponsored cars. Okay. So my thing was uh, Kellogg's Corn Flakes and Skittles. Mm Mm-hmm. And um, the, the actor's name, actually, Fred, um, we're sitting at a table. We didn't have scripts, per se. It was largely ad-libbed, but we were just mm-hmm. going through everything with the producer. And he said, okay, your character is this, so you're going to combine Skittles and cornflakes and Fred. You get Spam mm-hmm. and uh, Tammy Tucker's Salsa. Mm-hmm. 
and a true professional. He just spooned that spam right out of the can, <laughs> you know, with a heavy dose of salsa. But when we were sitting at the table, I'm watching him because when I was a kid, Mr. Mephisto was, you know, white grease paints and black and everything and costume. But I'm listening to him and I'm watching him and I finally shout out, you're Mr. Mephisto. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. That's me. <laughs> and so I got to I got to work with Mr. Mephisto. Fred's no longer with us, but um, so anyway. But the creature features uh, all about those classics, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, trivia. Let's see if we trip anyone up. What's the name of Frankenstein's monster? <laughs> you know the answer, Kevin. What's the name of Frankenstein's monster? Trivia question. Frankenstein's monster was called <laughs> It's Alive. <laughs> Frank, Frank, Frank Frankenstein was the monster. I don't know. <laughs> I don't that, know. That's what a lot of people think. Yeah. Her, Herman? Any he, he had his own Herman, TV show called uh, The Monsters? It was just The Monster. <laughs> oh. So the people monster, referred yeah. to that you know the, the costume or the whatever as as Frankenstein, they, they yeah, erroneously yeah. call the monster Frankenstein, but uh, yeah. it's just the monster. So I, I, thought, I thought for sure with Monster Hunters, you would have that trivia question. Um. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what other, let me just kind of, we'll, we'll sum up uh, as far as you mentioned um, Monster Hunters includes... Is it cryptozoology? Yeah, yeah. And that would be Yeti, Bigfoot, werewolves, a mm. few of our favorite things. And then it includes UFOs. And yeah. And includes ghost hunters. Are there? Are we missing some categories that also made it into the the final edition of the book? That would be um, uh, the main three things that are kind of under the umbrella of paranormal themes. Cryptozoology, UFOs, ghosts, other stuff, you know, demonology, um, sometimes theories about like... Uh, Atlantis. Yeah, right, uh, you know, mysterious places. So those would all fall under paranormal, generally speaking. What, what do, like, the paranormal investigators and conspiracy theorists have in common? There's, a, there's an overlap. I would say um, my first four books all overlap a little bit in that there's a theme of like people who are blurring the line between reality and fantasy a little bit. So there's definitely overlap in paranormal stuff and conspiracy, um, especially with like UFOs in particular but also things like Mothman or Chupacabras. There are theories that those were like government experiments that had gotten loose. Gone terribly know. wrong. Um, and uh, Wasn't there a Chicago yeah. Mothman? Yes, that was a very interesting case. Very interesting case. I'm not sure what's going on there, but uh, it, it, would, it would seem a lot of it were pranksters fabricating stuff on the internet. But what do you think Another that thing that's like, you know, fake news or, you know, easy to create something fake. Oh, yeah. sorry, maybe, yeah, maybe I, I cut you off. Like, but what do you think the people that get interested in these things have in common? Is there, like, some kind of com common profile or personality or something? I mean, for one thing, I always tell people that life can be really boring a lot of times, and... There isn't this great age of discovery because the world has been pretty thoroughly explored. I mean, there's still parts. So the I think people science, et cetera. people are looking for something exciting in their life. They want to have an adventure or like um, feel like they're in a, a Dan Brown novel or something. And so that's why I think a lot of them get interested in this stuff, just because it's something to add some excitement. Spice it up a little bit. What's well, so otherwise? Like a thunderbird. A thunderbird. What sure. the heck is that? <laughs> Thunderbirds. Um, I mean that. Isn't it a car? 
<laughs> I, I got my foot ran over by a Thunderbird <laughs> once. Thunderbirds, uh, I mean, that dates back to indigenous stories about uh, very large birds of prey, but ones that have, you know, wingspans of 15, 20, 30 feet. And more humanoid No, shape. just giant, giant oh, just birds. Gi giant yeah. birds. Yeah. And uh, so it dates back to indigenous lore, but um, there have been people who have said that they've actually seen birds of that size, so they're generally refer referred to by cryptozoologists as thunderbirds. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to pop a picture up on the screen, and then you're going to explain to us the okay. picture. All right. Excellent. Ooh. So let's she try this. Reacts. And then let's see <laughs> if First you us, get this <laughs> and this. And there we go. Oh, yeah. I see that picture. Who is that? <laughs> and I believe uh, this was 2015. Yes. Uh, so that's, um, I went to the Chicago Ghost Conference after my book came out. I had a table there. And uh, someone else on the vendor floor was Sven Gulli. Um, Sven Gulli, like you're saying, he was a whore host like Mr. Mephisto Like Mr. Mephisto. Was. Is that who this is? Yes. No, Sven, well, Sven Gulli is that. That's Sven Gulli. Uh, Sven Gulli, and he's had a show uh, in Chicago since the late 70s. And uh, he's actually one of the more successful horror hosts because his show is now nationally syndicated by the MeTV channel. So he's still a Saturday night favorite. Wow. And, and um, he's and been around since the 70s. Yeah, and he actually, there was someone who called himself Sven Gulli in the early 70s, and he was on his staff, and he sort of took that role over after he retired. He became the second Sven Gulli. Nice. And has been running continuously since then. And uh, But no one quite hit the, the stardom of Elvira. Elvira was the most... Commercially successful. Commercially successful. And I would say Sven Gulli is probably a close second. Staying power. Yeah, um, he has a huge following, especially in Chicago. Um, and uh, yeah, very beloved. As you can see, he's holding his rubber trademark chicken? rubber chicken, and that dates As back to the first Sven Gulli. He wanted to have something when because they make really corny jokes when they're introducing these old horror movies. <laughs> so. Throwing tomatoes is not a great thing to do in a TV studio, so they came up with this, uh, the, you know, the crew would throw rubber chickens at him when he make a bad joke. <laughs> what else you got, Kev? That's it. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I, I like the concept, though, have our guests react to Well, it's things. great that you showed that slide, actually, because um, I think you wanted to ask about what I'm working on now. And uh, I was on, I was a producer on a documentary uh, that came out this month, or we had our work in progress premiere this month. It's called I'm Your Host, and it's about four hosts local to the Kenosha area. And actually, Mr. Mephisto is in it for a hot second because he's in one of the, the clips. So um, Kenosha has an unusually large population of, uh, of horror hosts. They have four horror host shows in a relatively small city. So this documentary um, kind of is a little behind the scenes. We and it's interviewed I'm them. Host. I'm your host I is the name of the documentary. The title. Yeah. And uh, it's we're going to do another screening in Kenosha next month, and then we're going to continue to submit it to film festivals. So while I was working on that, I also wrote. Um, an article about the history of horror hosts for Atlas Obscura. And I talked about classic hosts like Vampira, Elvira, Sven Gulli. And uh, that article I think turned out really well and I'm working on developing it potentially into a book that kind of details the history of horror hosts. So. Which of course came like one of my favorite uh, vampire movies, and I I love all of them mm -hmm. for various reasons, especially the ones that are kind of cheesy and comedy. <laughs> but uh, it was it was a silent movie. No, Nosferatu. No yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, first you have to have the genre before mm -hmm. you can have the hosts. Yeah. 
So it is in this book project. I am going to talk about horror when did history we first in general. See, like Vampira. I mean, she's forties, fifties. Uh, fifties, yeah. It kind of evolved. There were radio programs that were kind of a similar idea, and then it evolved. And then uh, Vampira had a show in 1954. She's considered to be the first horror host. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and um, you know, later on in the 80s, Elvira was kind of derivative of of her. And well, there was a hotly uh, contested lawsuit. That's right. Yeah, uh, because originally it was going to be a reboot of the Vampire Show, mm-hmm. but negotiations fell apart, and then at the last minute, they decided to change her name, and uh, Vampira tried to sue her, um, but the the judge ruled that you know, the the likeness wasn't similar enough that it was it was different. What do so. you think about that? Um, I mean, I see it <laughs> both ways. Um, Vampira, actually, her character was she saw the old Adams Family cartoons mm-hmm. in the New Yorker before the show, mm-hmm. and so she modeled her character kind of on Morticia Adams. She borrowed, and, <laughs> right? I mean, every, that's what I'm saying. Everyone steals. She's influenced by. Everyone kind of takes something from and we're other talking people. The New Yorker cartoons. Yeah, and so, uh, and like I say, you know, it's uh, it, there's all of these different elements that kind of merge into that so um so you know i can see where elvira was just hired to play this character and she made it her own you know she absolutely but did. at the same time i can see where vampire would be upset because uh, yeah. they told her we're going to reboot your show and the original intention was they were going to hire a younger her. actress to play vampire and she would play vampire's mother uh, and okay because i knew would, that she was in yeah. she was be- potentially injured financially and hence yeah. the lawsuit and so on and so and forth. And she was going to be, she was going to get a producer credit sure. and, uh, you know, a, a weekly check for her role on the show and sure. for being a namesake. So Ben's still waiting for his producer check. <laughs> um, so we've got about, it's about 11.14. Okay. I didn't want to take too much more of your time, yeah. but I did want to give you a chance to, I don't know, maybe share one or two of your favorite Milwaukee, uh, you know, places? centered uh, yeah. ghost stories or places yeah. um, that maybe I could go to. You know, yeah. Um, um, so it is a season when everyone loves to talk about ghost stories, uh, and I always love to talk about ghost stories. But so we'll see. We could talk about a couple quickly. I think um, the first, the most famously haunted location in Milwaukee uh, is the Fister Hotel. And, um, Which understandably have not invited the investigators in, and it just kind of reminds me of one of the scenes in Ghostbusters. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Anywho, yeah. um, what's uh, what's some of the history of more than one entity mm-hmm. to bring me up to speed on the Fister? So the, the Fister, by the way, uh, it opened in 1893, so it's been a lot around for a long time, and. Um, the original stories were about Charles Fister, who uh, is the namesake of the hotel. He died in 1929. In the hotel? Uh, I, no, he didn't die in the hotel. But people, um, the staff, report seeing his ghost there after his death, uh, particularly in the lobby. So this is great, because you can visit the Fister. Even if you're not a guest, you can walk into the lobby and look around. They have a little bar right in the lobby you can go to. So if you do go in there, look up towards the second floor because um, uh, right across from the reception desk up on the second floor, there's a railing and his ghost has often been spotted leaning on this railing and looking down at the lobby below him. Um, And he's been spotted in other places Mm -hmm. in the old part of the building as well. And the staff said that they weren't frightened by this actually, that um, he was kind the of warm. Factor. He was He's right. just making sure everything's running smoothly. Yeah, not every yeah. ghost yeah. is like the Kentucky. Yeah. But uh, in the early 2000s, it's, it's very strange because um, a number of Major League Baseball players began reporting about their experiences there. And now there's been dozens of baseball players who have said that they've had some kind of experience there, um, a lot of 
knocking and scratching on the walls. Uh, so like TVs, when, when people lights come in to them. play the you know brewers and whatnot, you know visiting teams get right. st- stay at the Fister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's been so many reports of them having very frightening experiences to the point well, where where some uh, players and even whole teams have decided that they don't want to stay because you checked out. <laughs> they're like we're right. we're not going to stay there again. Yeah. So, okay, so definitely, uh, Fister, I'm looking forward to cocktails in the lobby. Mm-hmm. What other, what other, some of Milwaukee's more notorious or accessible? Yeah, here's another one. It's not going to be around much longer, so we'll see what happens. But the Milwaukee Public Museum is supposed to be haunted uh, specifically by one of their old curators named Dr. Stefan de Borhegi who is Hungarian. I love this. He's Hungarian. He always wore an opera cape instead of a jacket if it was cold. He smoked a pipe. He would greet women by kissing them on the hand. And uh, he's responsible for a lot of those very old dioramas you'll see. The ones that look old, they are old. He built those in the 60s. And then, tragically, uh, he died in a car accident on his way to work one day. And now they say that he's still haunting the third floor of the museum specifically. Ooh. And that people will feel this kind of cold energy pass through them. Um, the security systems will malfunction. And his portrait is hanging up there on the third <laughs> floor. So maybe he has some oh, attachment yeah. to that. Well, like so it'll be out. interesting, as you know, they're moving <clears throat> the museum to a new right. location. So maybe he'll be gone. He's but. Now. There's a lot of theories that ghosts kind of attach themselves mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. items. Sure, so he was on his way to work, maybe, unfinished business, etc. Maybe he'll move his way Is over to a new location. Is there a mansion or something like that? Yeah. It seemed like I read something um, about that for haunted Milwaukee locations. Yes, Captain Pabst is probably... Captain Pabst. Captain Frederick Pabst, uh, oh. the head of the Pabst Brewery, is um, frequently spotted... And seems to be getting around because uh, there's been reports of seeing him at the Paps Mansion, where he used to live, uh, at the Paps Brewery, which is on Juno between 9th and 11th. Um, and that used to be where his office and the okay. visitor center were. Sure. And the Paps Theater, which he bankrolled um, because that's when, you know, rich people spent their money building cool stuff like libraries and theaters. But uh, Paps Theater has one of my favorite Captain Paps stories, which is an an usher says he was one of the last ones in the building, and he walked into the theater room to see if anyone. Do we know about what what time, like like what year? I don't remember the year off the top of my head. I mean, it was a long time ago. It was because. Uh, it was probably ten years ago ish. Oh. I don't know. More recent than I thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not sure what year it was, but this usher went into the theater room and uh, he saw someone standing backstage. And this person was doing kind of a no no in this day and age. He was smoking back there. Very much a no no. So <laughs> he says, uh, You know, you're not supposed to be back there. What are you doing? And he says, This person turned around. And that was very clearly Captain Pabst himself. Captain Pabst is always depicted as having this sort of neatly trimmed white goatee and a mustache. And uh, he looked at the usher and exhaled this lungful of smoke. And then he dissipated into the air along with the smoke and disappeared. So by a long time ago, I was I was thinking when Captain Pabst would have been alive, and no, and when long the, and when had, the theater yeah. was originally built. Yeah. But what you were taught, so only about 10 years ago did a Ish, yeah. someone have this experience Experience with his ghost, yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. ha- has has P- PIM ever been invited there? Uh, I don't know if they've done Paps Theater. I imagine that they probably have because they've done the Riverside many times, and that's the same uh, group maintains the Paps, the Riverside, and okay. Turner Hall. Okay. So. So they might have, yeah. And just to just to, to wrap up, no no personal ghost encounters. 
I've never witnessed anything personally. Not even like a cold spot or tingle. I mean, I've been I've been creeped out, but I mean, <laughs> that's kind of easy to do at in the dark that's in different. a weird environment. Yeah. Sometimes after one too many, Captain Paps comes visits me, and we sit down <laughs> and have a nice uh, chat. <laughs> Well, of course, you can't be any self-respecting theater if you don't have a ghost. I was talking about the history of the ghost light in a, in a different episode that we did. There are um, many, many ghost stories in Milwaukee, and I think it is because we, we do have a remarkable amount of old buildings mm-hmm. in the city. So, you know, any building that's been around more than 50 years, let's say, might have some ghost story attached to it. But, I mean, yeah, American Ghost Walks is um, a local company that now does tours throughout the Midwest. I'm one of their tour guides. Um, So, you know, this is obviously a busy month for us. But we've built two whole tours of ghost stories just downtown. And uh, so there's a lot. So you're still in peak season then, are you? Yeah, oh yeah. You're going to be... Maybe we should come and join you for a ghost walk. Yeah, I'm doing... How would, uh, we, how would we find you for that? Or uh, find the ghost walk? AmericanGhostWalks.com. I lead uh, the Third Ward Tour Friday night. The Shadow of City Hall Tour Saturday night. I love the name. The Shadow and, of City and Hall. And then we're doing Shadow of City Hall again on Halloween proper, which is Tuesday. So, so there you go. Don't be afraid. Yeah. Come out and walk the streets. And what I love about the tour is not only that I get to share these ghost stories, but many times uh, people on the tour have stories of their own that they share with me. Or add, like, um, it's been great on a couple tours, we'll talk about a business and someone on the tour will be like, I used to work there and this is totally true. It's haunted. It's definitely haunted. Or, and then I get to be like, hey, this is not a paid actor. They're, they're telling you, not me. Are those tours like walking tours? Or? Yeah, I would say the best way to describe it is it's more of a walking history tour with ghost stories mixed into it. Gotcha. So we tell the history of the buildings, and then uh, you know some people have told us firsthand experiences that we have. And I'm like, well, you know, this is what this person says. They used to work here, and this and this happened. So, yeah. Do you have like secret fans up in the rafters somewhere that every now and then just <laughs> no? And I do that you can just trigger. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I do think that some people are disappointed because they're like people have been like, are we gonna have an experience? And I'm like, maybe. I don't yeah. think it's likely, but I do think people think they're gonna have an actual experience, or that there is gonna be someone dressed as a ghost that pops out of a garbage can or something. I don't know. So that's not what it is. That's why I try to be like, it's more of a history tour with some spooky stories woven into it. So, yeah. T, I want to make sure, is there, have we left any stone unturned for today as far as shout outs, promos, current projects, direct people back to your website? Yeah, I mean, I would say the website, I'm always up to something unusual, so the uh, best place to get an update on that is my website, where I have more information on my books. Um, I list upcoming yeah, appearances. Yeah, we only talked about two of them. Right, yeah. Yeah, I've written five. More. I've got at least two or three being developed, I guess is how I would put that. Excellent. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. For coming and joining us. Mm-hmm. And an absolute... Pleasure. A pleasure, yeah. And with that, I don't think we're going to get any better than this. Kevin, take us out for a brief pause for the cause. But stay tuned, everyone. There's still more to the broadcast. <laughs>